Welcome everybody to the December Plant Lovers Tour. Um, as Chris mentioned, it's uh, um, highlighting some of the uh, treasures in Oak Grove and Plantsman's Walk, I mean Plantsman's Wood. Um, even if you're fairly familiar with the Arboretum, you might wonder, well, just where is Plantsman's Wood and Oak Grove? Um, which is, explains why I'm starting here, because if you've ever been to the Arboretum, you certainly know where the color trials are. And the color trials are in their um, not so colorful winter aspect of uh, freshly mulched beds, but now you can understand where Oak Grove and uh, the Plantsman's Woods are because they are on the other side of the road from the color trials. They start at the back of the mixed border, which is off of the Great Lawn, um, and extend to this road that borders um, the color trials, the annual trials. Um, originally, when the uh, mixed border was planted, it was backed up by uh, hundreds of feet of um, Nellie R. Stevens hedge which um, has gone away now and has given us about 30 foot more uh, bed space to plant the whole length. Um, and the uh, plantsman's wood, um, well, I think the earliest plantings were done here in 2010 because this part of the Arboretum um, is a more recent addition to the Arboretum. It's not 45 years old like the, um, the original part of the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. Um, and so the, um, and originally before it became the Arboretum, there was a certified plant professional plant collection here, which was one of this and one of that of the plants that were sort of um, the standard plants in the nursery industry that if people wanted to get a certified as a North Carolina certified plant professional, they had to be able to identify all those plants in the collection. But they went away and in 2010 um, was when this area was first planted. So many of the plants we're going to visit today were planted in 2010. And um, Plantsman's Wood was planted with the idea that in time the young trees would form a canopy and then there'd be other plants underneath them. Oak Grove gets its name because there's an awful lot of different oaks and we'll meet some really fascinating, beautiful oaks when we get down to that end of this area. So uh, it's no rhyme or reason as to what I'm going to show you um, because it's a collection of plants where there's one of this and one of that. And so we'll just highlight some of the things worth highlighting today. Um, the dividing point between um, Plantsman's Wood and Oak Grove is this pair of oaks, which predate um, the time that um, they were planted before this became part of the Arboretum. On the right is Quercus Fellows, the willow oak, one of the most common street trees, maybe throughout the southeast. And then this um, oak here is Quercus Schumardii, the Schumard oak. It has a number of other um, common names. I'm going to grab a leaf if I can reach one. Oh, let's see. Yeah. Two, two divisions in the oak genus, the genus Quercus, are the white oaks and what are known as either as the red or the black oaks. And one of my favorite one of my favorite teachers is my co-worker, Tim Alderton, and I learned from him that the uh, red black oak group is strictly a, a new world uh, group of oaks that you don't find red or black oaks in other parts of the world. And the red and black oaks, and again, those two names are used interchangeably for the same oaks, have sharp um, divisions to the lobing in the leaves, um, whereas white oaks are all, all the um, lobes are rounded. You think of a um, like our native white oak, Quirk, Quercus alba. Um, so this has the very deep sinuses typical of many of the uh, oaks in this group, 
and Quercus schumardii is closely related to um, scarlet oak, and indeed scarlet oak has these great big rounded sinuses. Um, now we'll turn our attention this direction to a, an American elm. Um, American elm is, well, the elms are ulmus, U-L-M-U-S, and that's ulmus americanus. It's a cultivar called Jefferson. It's one that was planted in the 1930s around the mall in Washington, D.C., and has never suffered from Dutch elm disease. I just knocked this out. Did I mute myself? Still hear you. Okay, good. Sorry. I get, got too excited about that elm. Um, and um, so, uh, as uh, Dutch elm disease was introduced, I think, in the early 1900s and really devastated American elms to a large extent. There's a lot of breeding work going on to uh, develop disease-resistant elms, crossing American elm with some of the Asian species that are resistant to Dutch elm disease. But Jefferson is a pure Almus americana that is resistant. And, you know, it's become a fairly good-sized tree since 2010. Um, I'm going to turn our attention this way to this rose. Um, this is in a series of roses known as um, Easy Elegance series. This one is actually Easy Elegance uh, Cashmere. Yeah, Cashmere, Easy Elegance Cashmere. Now, um, in the modern habit of naming plants is actual cultivar name is B-A-I-M-I-R. Um, they were bred by Bailey Nursery. And so the, all these roses in the e Easy Elegance series start with B-A-I for Bailey Nursery. Um, but when you go in the garden center, you're gonna find it under Easy Elegance Cashmere. And they were bred for disease resistance uh, we do not spray any roses in the garden. Um, insects are not a really big problem with roses, but uh, the ones that are susceptible to black spot um, usually defoliate repeatedly over the course of the summer. And you see here it is December and the foliage is still clean. So we highly recommend the Easy Elegance series of roses. And there's many different ones. The full range of colors that roses come in. Um, this one looks very much like a hybrid tea rose with a high pointed bud. Um, but there's also lovely singles and everything in between. Um, the only thing I would advise uh, with about this series of roses when you do a little uh, online research or you're reading the label in the nursery, and they tell you how tall and wide it gets. We have found they get quite a bit taller and wider than they say. You know, I'm five foot 11 and you can see that this is quite a bit taller than I am. And this is one plant. And so, you know, it's easily six foot wide. And I'm gonna guess if you read the tag, it might say it gets four feet tall and here it's over six foot tall. Um, I'm, I might just talk about this plant. It's not exciting this time of year, but if, if you've moved here from a colder part of the country, you might be missing your lilacs. Um, the common lilac, Syringa vulgaris, vulgaris meaning common, um, doesn't thrive here. It can be grown, but it, it doesn't thrive. Uh, but there has been a lot of breeding work to develop um, lilacs that don't need as much winter chilling, so they do better in warmer climates. Um, some of them were bred for like Southern California, but also for the Southeast US. And this is one, um, oh, Betsy Ross. Yeah, Betsy Ross is the cultivar. And it's a hybrid, um, but it looks just like the common lilac and it has big trusses of pure white flowers that are quite fragrant, not super fragrant, but still very much that lilac fragrance that I presume everybody loves. 
We had a good question about roses just a moment ago. So I thought since we're near the rose, it'd be a good time to ask it. Eric, one of our, of course, people online has asked, what causes roses to grow branches, but not flowers? He has some in his front yard he inherited when he moved in and they're just all viney right now and just all branches. No flowers since he moved in in April of this year. Um, well, I wonder if he's talking about rose rosette branchy. Um, some roses only bloom once. The old European roses and a lot of climbers only bloom once. And if you moved in in late April, maybe it was done blooming already. Um, uh, but when, you know, when he says they're all branchy, do you mean that instead of like with this branch here where it now has three side branches, uh, there's a dreadful disease called rose rosette, where instead of a normal number of branches, it'll have, you know, 20, 30, 50 tiny little branches. And though it's common for a lot of roses to have red pigment in the new growth, in rose rosette, that's um, even more pronounced. Um, and it, it produces what's known as a witch's broom because it's all dense and twiggy like a broom. So I don't know if that's what Eric is seeing on his roses. I, I had a possible idea since Eric had just moved in. Yeah. Um, I can only imagine uh, the real estate agent that listed the house telling the previous homeowners, these roses are crazy, cut them back to the ground. And, yeah. Uh, they're just working on growing up because they, they could have been climbing roses or just grow a cane yeah. for, for a while. And then we'll flower at a later time, like e even next year. Well, and if it's a rose that only blooms once in April or May, it blooms on old wood. Mm -hmm. So if you cut it back hard in the wintertime, you're cutting off all the flower buds that would have been produced in April or May. Um, and so the new growth they produce subsequent to that, well, yeah, they might have been all just brand new growth. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I don't have enough details to really know what the answer is to Eric's question, and, and but it might be Eric one of those. Eric What's doesn't it? know what the rose is because yeah. he inherited it from the previous right. ones. He can send us some photographs and, yeah. and just see what's going on. And we just had a question and I missed it too. What was the cultivar of the American elm? Jefferson. Jefferson. There like, you, go. you know, it's from the yep. mall in Washington, D.C. So maybe it was near the Jefferson Memorial there or something. Go. Thank you, Doug. Appreciate sure. it. Uh, yeah, we'll move on this way. This is a bright yellow variegated form of the common um, Chinese horned holly, Ilex cornuta. Um, now, this, the wild type Ilex cornuta is, is, has several prominent lobes to the leaf that terminate in a very sharp spine, but this leaf is more like the Burford cultivar of Ilex cornuta, where there's just one fairly small terminal spine, but this is a brightly yellow variegated one. We see some parts of the plant where it's solid yellow, others where it's yellow margined. This has been really slow, um, but I almost think it's looking like it has settled in, so maybe next year it'll take off. But it's a bright, bright spot of color in the garden year round. And I do see that it's a female, so the contrast of red fruit with that yellow foliage is pretty dramatic. Um, I'm guessing that this foliage, the, not the foliage, the fruit hasn't fully colored up yet because um, normally Ilex cornuta has bright red fruit. Uh, another holly, another Asian species, Ilex integra. Um, uh, this is the cult of our ogon, ogon meaning gold. And the, when it flushes new growth in the spring, the foliage is bright gold. Now this spot might be getting a little bit too shady for it to show a lot of yellow. Um, so um, it might normally, if it was grown out in full sun, still have some yellow new growth on it. Um, Arboretum has probably hundreds of different cultivars of Japanese maple, Acer palmatum. This is one that um, I really like. It's one of the bamboo-leafed um, Japanese maples. 
where the leaf is reduced to just real slender. I guess it doesn't show up well against my red shirt, but you see it, it doesn't have the jagged edge to the leaf like um, a common acer palmatum. Um, it, there's also fairly few divisions to this leaf. I seem to be mostly three leafed, or not leafed, but three divisions to the leaf. Um, it is the cultivar Pung Kill, P-U-N-G-K-I-L, two words. Um, and one feature I really enjoy is the stems are almost black. They're black now, but uh, they're really evident in the winter. You could do a nice planting of various colored twig plants and you know combine this with uh, the coral bark Japanese maple and um, Oh, the one with um, yellow, yellow and coral twigs. Um, that name is, escapes me right now. And then this, the uh, almost black stems. It's also um, one problem with a, a lot of these bamboo leafed um, Japanese maples is they often will produce branches with um, the normal shaped leaf, the star shaped leaf but I'm not seeing any of that on this plant. Um, so maybe a little bit more stable in that characteristic. Let's see, we're gonna step on out this way. There are a lot of plants of great interest in here, but um, not so much this time of year, like rising sun, red bud. I'd rather talk about that in the spring or summer. Some of the beauty berries are, um, still real um, showy this time of year. This is a wild um, species from um, Oshima Island, part of Japan. It's uh, Calicarpa oshimensis. Um, beautiful clusters of, of tiny, whatever that color fruit is, bright sort of fuchsia purple. This good sized, um, evergreen tree is actually an avocado. Um, I can call it an avocado because it's um, in the genus Persea, P-E-R-S-E-A. And the common avocado, which I haven't eaten one since lunchtime, is Persea maricana. Um, and this is Persea liebmannii. Obviously named after somebody named Liebmann, L-I-E-M-A-N-N. -N. And um, these little black purple fruit maybe don't look all that much like an avocado, but when, I, when we split one open, the same um, bright green flesh inside, can, I don't know, can you see that? But um, you see, it's almost, you know, it's such a tiny, tiny mount. Tastes a bit like avocado. Um, you know, some year, maybe, you know, in my sabbatical year, maybe I'll sit here for a month and harvest enough of them to produce um, um, a teaspoon of guacamole. Um, all right, so in my hand, you see the fruit on the left. Um, whoops, that one ran away. It's camera shy. Um, you see the the seed, the, the lordy. <laughs> they just don't like duck. They're all running away. Yeah, the seed in my hand is almost as big as the fruit. So the amount of um, pulp, the amount of pulp. Um, between the seed and the skin is, is tiny. But um, Persia limonii is from um, Mexico and um, is closely related to Red Bay, which is native to the coastal plain of the Southeast US. Um, and our native Red Bay, Persia um, borbonia, um, is being attacked by some sort of disease. So. I don't know if this Persia wool is susceptible to that same disease. Um, 
I don't. I, I do wonder if there's any possibility of hybridizing this with Persia americana and producing um, a winter hardy hybrid with with fruit quite a bit bigger than these that might be worth growing. Um, avocado uh, foliage is used as a um, culinary herb. Oh, these have these have a great fragrance. Um, you know, uh, Persia is in the laurel family, so same family as bay and camphor and cinnamon. So a family with a lot of fragrance and foliage. Yeah, it has a nice fragrance. Um, so I don't know if in Mexico it's used as a culinary herb. Um, I've seen um, avocado leaves, dried avocado leaves, um, being sold in uh, Latino markets with the other culinary herbs. Okay, we're gonna... I have a quick question for you, Doug. This yes, is just sir. me personally. We used to have Persia down the uh, back of the mixed border. Is this the same one or was that a different no, one? No, that was an Asian species. And um, it's, I think those, they were Persia, but I think those ones are now reclassified as um, Macalus. Oh, Macalus yeah, Thunbergii. Mm -hmm. And um, there's one that's still there. And they were uh, really beautiful because the tree develops this sort of very architectural layering to them, um, sort of like a wedding cake. Um, and the leaves themselves were really pretty. They were very nice. But that Persia, um, now Macalus, what did I say it was? Thunbergii mm -hmm. um, is an Asian species as probably most things are named named for Mr. Thunberg. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Doug, appreciate sure. that. Um, we'll con con continue outside here. In preparing for this presentation today, I came to the realization that an awful lot of um, really wonderful plants in the J.C. Ralston Arboretum are um, Southwest U.S. and Mexican in origin. And this is a species of um, Cupressus, Cupressus um, guadalupensis, which is native to Southern California and Mexico and Baja California, which of course is part of um, um, Mexico. And initially the bark on the trunk begins to peel and then it's shed and the remaining bark is, is this glossy multicolored bark that's really beautiful. It's olive green and cinnamon brown. Um, uh, the, the, in time, the plant can get quite large. Um, I don't know, you know, being a plant native to the Southwest, whether it'll be a long-term plant here in the humid East, but it certainly has grown well since about 20, 2010 or so. And an, another cupressus um, is this lovely cultivar of Arizona cypress here. This is uh, cupressus arizonica, you know, native to Arizona and, and other parts of the Southwest U.S. and Mexico. Um, and this is the cultivar sulfurea, referring to sulfur, the color. Um, and there's no end of conifers and other plants with bright yellow to gold foliage, but there's not too many that are this soft sulfur yellow. You see the, the new growth is most yellow and then it, as it ages, it returns to the normal um, sort of blue-green, so it's lovely bicolor effect. Um, it's also, even though this has gotten pretty large since 2010, um, it's still much slower growing than other selections of Arizona cypress like um, Carolina sapphire and uh, blue ice and gray smoke, or maybe it was silver smoke, which would be probably twice the size in the same amount of time. It's also remaining very full and those other cultivars tend to become very open in time. Another Southwest native 
uh, a very large and fairly scary looking yucca, yucca uh, shadii. Uh, I'm sure named for somebody with the family name of Schott, S-C-H-O-T-T-I. I guess two eyes, yes. Um, you know, one of the big um, Spanish bayonet type yuccas. It is pretty dangerous, but very big and bold and dramatic and has not suffered from our, our cold winters when we have them. Um, we'll look sort of skyward here. This is bald cypress. It's, um, you know, turning the wonderful rusty uh, orange color that uh, is typical of bald cypress this time of year. It is a conifer, a cone bearing plant. And we often think of conifers as being evergreen plants, but, um, um, you know, the majority of conifers are evergreen, but there's a significant number that are deciduous and bald cypress and um, dawn redwoods are probably the two best known of the deciduous conifers. Um, this is a named cultivar. Um, I don't remember the cultivar name off the top of my head because it's a series of letters and maybe a few numbers, but it's um, one so, uh, sold with the trademark name of Green Whisper. And How can you I, not remember that one, Doug? It rolls off the tongue. It's JFS hyphen SGPN. Well, you're right, Tim. I mean, uh, Lord, I didn't even remember your name. You're right, Chris. Um, yeah, the, it's, uh, modern plant cultivar names are a real nightmare. But uh, I, I love bald cypress. They're beautiful trees. The shade they cast is very light. Um, but the typical bald cypress has, um, um, well, the foliage color in the summer is not a really beautiful color. It's sort of a tired looking green, but Green Whisper was selected because the foliage color is a fresh, bright green all summer long. So if I was planting a full size bald cypress, it's one I would plant. And right in front of it is one of my all-time favorite plants in the Arboretum. It's a, um, and it, it's more dramatic when it finishes dropping all its leaves. It's a dwarf form of um, Tilia cordata, the little leaf linden native to Europe. And, you know, dwarf is relative. Uh, this plant was transplanted here in 2010 um, the Arboretum's uh, um, file maker records, uh, every plant is given a unique number known as the accession number. And the first two digits are the year that they arrive. So anything that arrived this year starts with 21. But there's some things that predate the time when uh, such records were kept. And those start with XX. So we don't know exactly when this was originally planted in the Arboretum, um, but it got transplanted here um, in 2010. So it's a lot smaller than a Tilly cordata, um, you know, wild type of the same age. And it's real dense. And um, even though I don't like cold weather, I love uh, the garden in winter, and one of the beauties in the garden in winter is the architecture of deciduous trees and many shrubs as well. And so this is a real beauty all, all winter long. Oh, and I never even mentioned its cultivar name. It, it just is called dwarf weeping, Tilia cordata dwarf weeping. Um, don't, I wouldn't know where to tell you to buy one if you went looking, but you know, the internet might turn up something. I'm standing here next to one of our native uh, species of birch. Birch are in the genus uh, Betula. This is Betula alleg alleganensis, you know, referring to the Allegheny Mountains. So native to the uh, Midwest and um, upper Midwest as well. Um, it also at one time was known as Betula lutea, referring to yellow, and its common name is yellow or golden uh, birch. And I don't know if you all have the 
uh, scratch and sniff capability on your on your computer, but um, I'll hold this up to the camera. Um, Betula um, alleghenensis and Betula lenta, the sweet birch, uh, are the source of a wintergreen-like fragrance. And, you know, everybody knows about root beer. Um, fewer people know about birch beer, but um, these birches were used to uh, flavor, you know, a, a soda known as um, uh, birch beer. And I'll pass this on and maybe some others can attest to the fact that it is fragrant. Now, we, we don't need every visitor to the Arboretum scratching the bark, um, but it is a delightful feature of, of, um, of the sweet and yellow birch. Um, you can We've see had the- had someone on our online audience, how does this birch hold up to borers? Well, it's held up thus far. Um, and I'm guessing in this location, it was probably planted about 2010. Um, in time, um, the yellow birch becomes a large tree. Um, it's an important timber tree. Birch wood is um, highly favored for, for uh, you know, I guess paneling and furniture and stuff. But I'm guessing that this tree in a, in a milder climate, a, a climate with a milder summer, would, would have been a much larger tree by now. It probably would also have typically grown as a single trunk tree. I've seen um, sweet birch, which I have more experience with, you know, a big trunk on them in, in time. Okay, not all that evident quite yet, but this is a selection of um, Winterberry holly, native Winterberry holly, because there's also Asian counterparts to um, our native Winterberry hollies, Ilex verticillata, typically red. This is a selection called winter gold. So these orangey yellow fruit that will persist well into the winter or at least until the um, birds strip the fruit off of them. Um, uh, Ilex verticillata is one of, one of the uh, species of hollies that are uh, deciduous. Um, you know, we, beginning gardeners are often surprised when they discover that not all hollies are evergreen. Um, and this is one of the deciduous ones. In the wild, it would typically grow in swamps and it doesn't have to have a wet site, but will thrive in a wet site. And, you know, if you have a wet site where you can't grow lots of other things, Winterberry holly is a, a good choice for those locations. And there's many selections. There's uh, been some breeding work to produce plants that mature at a smaller height. Um, they do have some tendency to sucker underground and form big colonies. It's a great thing to cut for um, a winter arrangement because the fruit will hold up for a long time. Um, they're really a wonderful showy plant in the late fall, early winter garden. Um, and NC State's um, plant breeder extraordinaire, Tom Rainey, has introduced a number of different um, um, uh, Winterberry ho um, holly cultivars that are quite compact growing. This is a selection of Prunus incisa. Incisa referring to the deeply incised margin to the leaf. The leaves are too short, small to show up. Um, and this uh, Prunus incisa is the Mount Fuji cherry, native to uh, Japan. And there are more than a few uh, different cultivars of it. And this is the, the cultivar Shikizaki. Um, I can hold the label up if that would help. Um, and it's the weeping uh, Fuji cherry. Um, the typical growth habit is more upright. But you see this is broad 
and low grown. Mm. Um, it's this cultivar, not the other cultivars of Fuji cherry, amazes us every year because it's already been blooming since probably about October and it's now December 1 and it will continue all winter long. Um, it, um, it, it's, if we had a real cold spell, the open flowers will be uh, killed by the cold. But once we have another mild spell of more than a few days, the flower, it will resume blooming. So it will bloom for, I don't know, five months of the year. Hey. Um, so, and, and this is also about mature height for prunus and sizes. So it's rather small for a little cherry. Um, the, my only, the only thing I don't like, and this is not fact, but personal opinion is, it's sort of this very pale pink, and I like more decisive colors. Well, and there's also no fragrance um, to the flowers. But if you know uh, the winter flowering apricot, Prunus mume, um, which in time becomes quite large for a small tree, um, I think, you know, sometimes hybrid, uh, hybrids aren't possible between uh, different species, but if you could take the long blooming habit of this, the compact size of this, and cross it with Prunus mume to produce something that blooms as long as this does with a wider range of colors, you know, some colors approaching near red and the fragrance of Prunus mume, um, I think you'd really have something because I'm not, I'm not one who usually wants to stumpify anything, um, but I think for the smaller garden, a full-size Prunus mume is quite large and you don't really need you know, a 20 by 30 foot uh, Prunus mume, um, because even a much smaller one would give you enough fragrance and, and uh, flower display. So if any of you are out there looking for a breeding project, I think pruning, hybridizing Prunus um, incisa with, um, and specifically this cultivar Shikizaki with um, the Prunus mume might be a, a worthwhile project. Doug? Yes. We had a couple of questions sure. for, about this uh, Prunus. Marilyn is wondering, does this one need full sun? Um, full, uh, I'm sure it doesn't need full sun all day. Um, I'm sure it would bloom well um, in like the very light high shade of, of uh, loblolly pines and stuff. Um, the late Dr. Clifford Park in Chapel Hill gardened under just pine trees and his Prunus mumes, which were not the species, bloomed perfectly fine in that bright shade. And then we also added an, an anonymous question. How much heat can this cherry take? This is someone coming from more of the coastal areas. So maybe even winter chilling might be a good one to answer for him. Um, I, I don't, I just don't know. Um, we definitely have the heat here. Yeah, we have hot summers. Um, you know, if the question is, will they get enough winter chilling? Well, this starts blooming in October, so I don't, I think it'll bloom. You know, the vegetative buds probably have a, a need for a certain amount of winter chilling. Um, I don't know w what to expect on the coast. Um, cool, did, thank you, Doug. Yeah. Okay, what shall we look at now? I might, I think you can see it well enough through the red bud in front of it, but it's a um, columnar, not very tightly columnar selection of sugar maple. Um, when we walk past it, I'll have to find its name, but we might have a, a good view of it from here. Um, I certainly think the way cities in this area are building up where there's almost no space left for planting, that these uh, columnar forms of trees can really add a lot of living plants in narrow spaces. And Bell Tower, Bell Tower it, yeah, that Chris found the name. Uh, did, did everybody hear it or do I need to repeat it? Yeah, I'll put it in the chat. 
Okay, thank you. Um, and, you know, it's amazing the number of plants that um, are now available in columnar forms. Some of them stay tighter much longer and others are like, like us, we develop, a, you know, we sort of spread over time. I just realized a plant that I really wanted to talk about. Tell me if we need to go closer, but see this tree here? Yeah, the, the tallest one here that still has quite a um, bit of foliage on. That is a hazelnut, a filbert. What is it? But it's a Chinese species. It's Coralus chinensis. Um, and it actually becomes a large tree. Um, you know, I read, you know, 70, 80 foot is pretty common. Um, I also saw a figure of like 120 feet tall. Um, but certainly even 80 foot tall is a, is a large tree. Um, and it does bear um, hazelnuts um, that are considered edible. Um, they're also pressed for oil. Um, and so I, being a Chinese species and seeing how it's thriving here, it could be a good species for somebody interested in permaculture because you could grow it as the canopy tree in permaculture that would also produce um, edible nuts. And you can see already the long pendulous male catkins that will hang out all winter and probably bloom late winter. The female flowers on a filbert or hazelnut are quite small. Um, if you wander the woods in Piedmont, North Carolina, you probably have seen our, our native hazelnut, which is a small suckering shrub, but where it grows, it often covers a lot of ground. Um, but real interesting tree, uh, Coralus chinensis. It's considered somewhat endangered in China, um, even though it's very widespread in China. What's that? It looks like the bark is... Peely? Um, I think, so. yeah, the bark is sort of shaggy. Um, I don't know if we want to walk over and look at it or what's that? I got it. You Before got it? Walk, okay. Can we do an online question? Yeah. Eric was wondering if there is a smaller hazelnut that he could probably use for uh, privacy and maybe even nuts. He's down in uh, South Carolina 8B. Um, well, the common hazelnuts that are, you know, produce the commercially available nuts. I don't know, I don't have enough experience with them here, or, or let alone a warmer climate to know how well they do. And I, I think all of the coralists are deciduous, so mm -hmm. it would only be summer privacy. Yep. Um, so I don't really have a good answer to that question. Okay. We're still in Plantsman's Wood, so we haven't quite yet made it to um, Oak Grove, but I'm standing here in front of this beautiful Mexican oak. Um, it's Quercus germana, G-E-R-M-A-N-A. -A. Um, if we have a mild winter, it's largely evergreen. If, if we have a, like a, a real cold zone seven winter, it, it can suffer some dieback, but in these milder winters, the plant is really, uh, become fairly good sized. But the leaves are, are this beautiful, glossy, light-catching green. Um, one of many interesting oaks in this area. There are a few plants at the Arboretum that are unique to the Arboretum, or, or at least initially they were unique to the Arboretum. This is a weeping selection of um, our very common native um, American beech. Uh, beech is uh, Fagus, F-A-G-U-S, and this is Fagus grandifolia, um, but it is a weeping selection that has the cultivar name of white lightning. And it was found in this area. Uh, someone contacted, uh, the homeowner contacted the Arboretum say, I have this weird little tree um, you know, if you want it, you need to come and get it. 
and um, they were afraid that it was going to be run over by, um, you know, all-terrain vehicles and that kind of stuff. And in its early years, it was this frail little thing with just a few branches. And it was thought that it was going to be a dwarf. But now that it has really settled in, I think it will always be vertically challenged, so it won't get tremendously tall. But it is growing so strong. Um, between my two hands is the amount of growth it made this year. That's close to two feet of growth. That's not going to be a dwarf plant. It's just not going to go up. I think if you trained it up, you could get it up really high and then it would cascade down. I always want to find an old, very gaunt loblolly pine and plant something that's next to it and use the trunk of the pine to train um, something up like this to get a lot of height on it. Um, now, if you've never looked at a American beech closely. It looks like these are all little side branches, but these are the great big buds, the cigar-like buds. Um, it's a compound bud that opens out to a whole new shoot next spring. Um, so um, something that, uh, you know, it's, it's a plant that's difficult to propagate because it will not root from cuttings, but it can be grafted onto a seedling beech understock. So somebody who's a, people who are really good grafters do, do manage to uh, uh, propagate it that way. Um, so, you know, maybe at some point you'll be able to add one to your garden at home. Um, one of my favorite oaks in the Arboretum is this really odd Ponticum um, Armenian oak. It's a uh, Quercus ponticum, pontica, and you know, the leaves are pretty good size, but the growth is really congested. It, it's like a natural dwarf. And if you ever visit this plant, you know, the branches are very, very stiff. You see the, these great big buds are really tightly clustered. It's just a really interesting plant, especially in the winter months. And uh, behind me is an interesting selection of Magnolia cobis. It's one with a narrow growth habit. Uh, it used to be much narrower in, in youth and it's starting to spread, but might be an interesting plant to use in a breeding growth breeding program to develop more compact um, magnolias. We have have visited Rhodia japonica many times over the months of doing this program, but I wanted to point out the fruit on them. This fruit will color up um, bright red. It's still in the process of ripening, and it will persist all winter. Um, they're real easy to raise from seed. They're just really slow as seedlings. Um, you know, it'll, it'll take several months to germinate, and then the seedlings are pretty small for the first few years or so, but really easy. Um, and Rhodia japonica is a great plant for dry shade. It's evergreen. Um, there's lots of really beautiful variegated cultivars of it. Um, and though I don't like to say deer don't eat it because somebody's going to tell me they eat it in their gardens, I've never known deer to eat it. All right. And, um, a selection of a native shrub. This is uh, Agarista populifolia. Now, if you've been around for a while, you might have originally known it as Leucothoe populifolia. And this is a real tiny dwarf form of it. Taylor's treasure, I think from Taylor's nursery here in Raleigh. Um, the wild, the full size uh, agarista is, um, you know, nine, ten foot tall. It's a real robust grower, um, a plant that's very adaptable. The, the plants that are still known as Lukothui are lovely garden things, but are often a little bit uh, hard to please. But agarista. It'll grow in full sun, it'll grow in shade. This is very dry shade here under this willow oak. 
Uh, it will tolerate a wet site, um, pretty tolerant of, of dry as well. And um, it's same family as uh, blueberries and azaleas, and the flowers are a lot like um, Japanese Andromeda, those clusters of little white urn-shaped flowers. Um, and I don't remember if I already said it's evergreen, so it's also a nice evergreen shrub. Um, if, you, if you need a large screening plant and your, your um, preference is natives, then I would look for um, Agarista populifolia. This, um, or if you need a small shrub, this Taylor's treasure is a nice alternative. Where shall we go from here? Oh, we'll go meet some more oaks. We are now in Oak Grove. How are we doing for time? 4 p.m. Is that when we stop? Yeah, that's when you start contemplating stopping. Oh, okay. Well, you tell me when you want to stop. A couple more plants. Well, it also occurred to me, to me today when I was preparing this, we almost could do Oak Grove as a separate thing. This is a selection of Magnolia lavifolia. Um, not too many years ago, this type of magnolia was in a different genus. It was um, in the genus Michelia, or, or maybe Michelia. Um, but they decided they were all magnolias, so they're now all in the genus Magnolia. Um, they have little, well not terribly little, maybe two inch wide cream colored cup-like blooms. Um, I love them in the wintertime. These buds are very fuzzy. It's like velvet and this rich chestnut brown. Um, but in bloom, it's just, you know, it, it's more like a mock orange or, you know, some of the deciduous flowering shrubs and it's small flowers, but absolutely covered in flowers. So a very different aspect than, you know, certainly Magnolia grandiflora or, um, um, of the saucer magnolias, but a beautiful um, plant in bloom. Um, this cultivar, I think, is Snowbird. Yeah, Snowbird, a gift from Arboretum member um, Bobby Wilder. Um, Gail's favorite is another selection, and Gail's favorite is also really nice because it's a bit, quite a bit more cold hardy than some of the other selections of um, Magnolia lavifolia. We're here in the presence of several other oaks. Well, th this is an interesting oak back here. This one, Quercus insignis, has this really beautiful big leaf. It's a lot like a loquat leaf, but um, this oak is not very winter hardy and most years will die to the ground, so we're growing an oak tree like a um, herbaceous perennial. The leaves are, are pretty stiff, they, you know, like, a, like plastic, handsome leaf. Very, they don't look fuzzy to the eye, but if you were able to touch them, they're sort of velvety on the um, underside. Quercus insignis. I don't mean, I didn't, I don't know if this is another Mexican species. I'm not sure. What is it uh, Quercus insignis. This is a Asian oak. This is a uh, Quercus glauca. Um, Lord, I know the. Um, it's a variegated cultivar. Um, it's most highly variegated. Um, when it puts out new growth in the spring and then it becomes greener. But Quercus glauca is um, the ch Shimafu, that's right. Shimafu is the cultivar that sounds like a Japanese cultivar name. But Quercus glauca is a species that's been grown in the South for, for a good long time. So we know it's a good performer, especially when we have, um, you know, sort of normal winters or, or milder. Lovely evergreen. Tell me if I need to stop, Chris. Okay. Okay. This is a, another Mexican species. Tim has said that this um, um, 
one has doesn't suffer from cold spells. It's a, it's a lot like the um, oh, what was the one I showed you earlier? No, 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 like ten minutes ago. Um, and I need to step on the other side of the tree and find its label. Sartorii, Sartre's Elm, Sartre's Oak. Um, Sartor, S-A-R-T-O-R, somebody's family name, but very similar to the other Mexican oak. It's become quite a good sized tree. You don't encounter too many pine trees that are um, inten intentional hybrids between different species. This is um, a pinus hybrid called Domingo, and it's a hybrid between um, Pinus strobus, which is the eastern white pine, as in eastern North America, and the uh, Mexican white pine, which is, oh, um, it's Pinus ayacahuete or something like that, a long Mexican name. And it's very cold hardy. It, I saw it was rated as being cold hardy in zone four, which is a really cold zone. Um, but it's also um, heat tolerant too, so it has been thriving here. Um, and it has that lovely sort of long soft needles of the white pines and the white underside to the needles, so you end up with this sort of silvery aspect to, to the pine. This is a species of um, a poplar um, native to um, Southern California and Baja California in Mexico, other parts of Mexico. It's um, pop Populus monticula, monticula referring to uh, mountains, like Jefferson named his estate Monticello, meaning pretty mountain. Um, and I love it for its pale bark. Its common name is white bark cottonwood. Um, it's not quite white, but it is very pale, even paler than a beech. And it has thrived here despite being native to a, um, you know, very different growing conditions in uh, Southern California. It's gotten pretty big too. Doug, that's probably a good spot to stop. It's uh, okay. almost 410 or so. Okay. How about if we open it up to a few questions? We've sure. already taken care of, or at least I think I have, already taken care of all the questions in the chat. So if you have a question, go ahead and unmute yourself. You can ask it out loud or go ahead and put it in the uh, chat area. And uh, we do have one here from Jean. She says she's noticed the purple beauty berry um, that we have. And does the Arboretum have any white beauty berry? And which is more common? Well, the purple is the normal color of, of yep. beauty berries. Other, other than um, the Mexican beauty berry, what is that, a cuminata? Yep. Which is almost black, it's sort of dark, dark mulberry black. Um, that bright purple like we saw in the Oceamensis is the typical color of, of beauty berries. Um, white is, is the, you know, sort of like the albino form and we certainly have white forms of um, Calicarpa americana, the native one. And we had that for sale last year. And um, there are white forms of Calicarpa dichotoma, one of the Asian ones. And when they're grown by themselves, they'll come true from seed. Um, so yeah, the Arboretum does have um, both of those. And Welch's pink, which is kind of between the white and the uh, yeah. purple. That's a, that's a pretty one. Yeah. Thank you so much, Doug, for a great sure. tour. And thanks sure. to Alexander and Carol for helping yes, with the you uh, mobile uh, workstation that we had out here. We'll see you again next week and the week after and the week after and maybe the week after that one. <laughs> Hope you all have a great start to your December and look forward to seeing you online next week. See you later. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye.